Hi there, Year 10. <clears throat> this is the 12th video in the Genetics and Biotechnology series, um, and this is the final one in, um, for this particular topic. And we're just going to look at some of the impacts um, and potential areas of discussion and conflict in relation to uh, the application of biotechnology. So the first thing we want to do is just clarify the whole area around genetic engineering. And we're going to define genetic engineering as the manipulation of the genome of an organism. So all of the information, all of the chromosomes that together make up or code for all of the key features of an organism uh, are part of its genome. And when we change that and manipulate it in some way, um, then we are carrying out some form of genetic engineering. So we can do this by altering the base sequence. So <clears throat> altering that sequence of A, T, G, and C uh, in order to code for um, specific genes or to change um, the specific coding sequence um, for not only the genes, but then ultimately the proteins that are made from those genes. Um, but genetic engineering can also include the transferring of genes from one organism to another. And that's the area of transgenics um, that we've talked about or that I talked about on previous videos um, and also things like gene therapy. So there's a few areas there that sort of link into this whole idea of genetic engineering. Um, but this can also apply to um, all alter, um, alterations in the phenotype or the physical characteristics of organisms through things such as artificial selection. So there is um, more than one way of changing um, organisms and uh, indeed populations as a result of breeding techniques and also as a result of manipulation at the, gene, at the gene level. So we're just going to have a look at a couple of different applications and seeing where um, where they sit uh, morally, ethically, and scientifically. So one of the important things that we can do now that we know that we've mapped to the human genome is we can actually do some screening. And the importance about screening is it is it allows us to identify the presence or absence of certain genes that code for certain types of conditions. Now this could be something like Down syndrome, which has uh, that extra chromosome, 47 chromosomes. Um, so simply looking at the um, numbers of chromosomes is sufficient for you to um, identify Down syndrome, whereas other types of um, conditions, we're looking more for the presence of a specific gene, not just an extra chromosome. So there's three places really where this can occur. Um, the maternal serum screening, which is basically testing um, the um, fetus while it's still in the uterus. Uh, newborn screening, um, and uh, newborns can be screened for diseases uh, or for the presence of conditions like um, phenylketonuria or um, cystic fibrosis or other things such as that. And as an adult or even as a young adult, as you guys are, um, it, you can undergo testing for the presence of certain um, genes or predispositions to certain conditions such as Huntington's career, um, Parkinson's disease and those sorts of things. So we have a number of um, uh, screening tests that can be carried out to identify the presence of certain um, uh, predisposed, uh, predisposed conditions that are uh, coded for in the genetic information of each individual. Of course, the problem with this is that it starts to open questions about what sort of information do we want to make public, what sort of things, um, uh, what sort of uh, uses are going to be made of that information and by who, um, but I'll look at that uh, just in a later slide. One of the other areas that's being discussed quite significantly is the use of stem cells. Now stem cells are undifferentiated cells, so when your um, fertilization occurs, an egg is fertilized by a sperm, um, that produces a um, a zygote or a fertilized egg, which is a diploid cell, so it has the restored number, full number of chromosomes. Um, now that one cell contains all the information um, ultimately for the individual that will develop, um, but it has to become two cells, and then those two cells have to become four cells, and four cells, eight cells, and so on. And it, 
At this stage, when the cells are developing, there's no differentiation, not going to become muscle cells or blood cells or bone cells or um, nerve cells or anything else. Not at that point. So before they become differentiated into the specialized types of cells, as I mentioned, um, they are undifferentiated. So they have the potential, therefore, to develop into all sorts of different types of cells. But that potential is dependent on where we source the stem cells. If we source them from an embryo, then as that is the stage where the cells are developing, they are almost um, able to give rise to almost any type of cell. So they have greater potential um, to be used and um, in manipulated, uh, if you like, um, by the addition or extraction of genes in order to develop into an, uh, an individual. The problem, we can also get them from adults, but in adult stem cells, there is a more limited um, number of different types of cells um, that we can produce um, from adult stem cells. And this is one of the reasons why embryonic stem cell research is so big, um, because uh, there is great potential um, in, um, for future development, particularly um, in relation to human health, by looking at ways of manipulating embryonic stem cells. But to do that um, asks or at least raises some very significant ethical issues. One of the things that is very important to be aware of that we want to try and um, keep in our minds, I guess, is the fact that there are a lot of very significant implications that are associated with um, genetic engineering or genetic screening or genetic um, therapies. Um, the first is that there obviously needs to be some sort of discussion had around these, even something like um, in vitro fertilization is something that a couple would still want to discuss with, say, at least their doctor um, and preferably with uh, counsellors as well, because of the implications of not only the process itself, but the fact that the process may not um, could go on for a long time and may not actually result in a child at the end of it all. So there's some um, personal emotional issues that can be raised here. Um, as we've talked about before, there's some reproductive consequences. So things like IVF can certainly give rise um, to children that may not have um, been conceived any other way. And what happens with that? What happens when couples are looking for a baby? Can they actually look at just having a baby or can they actually look at trying to specifically pick the um, sex of their child, a boy or a girl. If we have tests that can identify certain types of diseases or certain types of conditions, at least your predisposition, uh, predisposition even if it's something like an increased um, risk of heart disease, for example, that sort of information might be very useful to uh, a health insurance company. And perhaps they may uh, limit your ability to access health cover, or they may um, provide significantly higher premiums that you'd have to pay in order for you to be covered because of that increased um, risk or that pre-existing condition that may be present in your genetic code. Who owns the information? Is it your information? Is it the genes in your body? Are they owned by you or are they owned by uh, corporations who know the techniques or develop the techniques um, to actually identify where those genes were. So if there are certain tests for um, cystic fibrosis, for example, um, and you want to have that test to see whether you're carrying the gene or not, um, do you pay for that? Um, is it right that the company that developed that test um, charges you a significant amount of money each time you want to have that test and so on? So who owns the information? Is it your genetic information? Or is it the test that's actually owned and therefore um, uh, companies um, and uh, medical corporations can um, legitimately charge you for um, actually accessing information about your own body? Uh, I mentioned in the last slide embryonic stem cells and uh, this raises a lot of questions in terms of the use of embryos. Now, I mentioned in one of the previous slides that in IVF, often uh, multiple embryos will um, potentially be available um, in one particular session of IVF. 
and excess embryos can be frozen and used by the couple if they wish to have a child at a later time or at least to try again um, for a child at a later time. But, um, but if we look at things like embryonic um, stem cell research, then often what that will do is it will extract some of those embryonic cells and may mean that the embryo is no longer viable. And of course, this raises questions um, for a lot of people about when it is that life begins. How many cells constitute a life? Is a fertilized egg a life? Uh, are 10 cells, 12 cells, 15 cells, 50 cells, um, 2000 cells? Is that where life begins? Is it um, not a life until it actually looks like a little baby? These are ethical questions and ethical questions don't have right and wrong answers. They are very much about um, how you feel and why you feel that way. And sometimes they're influenced by um, our parents' beliefs, uh, our cultural beliefs, our religious beliefs, um, and, and also our experiences, our personal experiences of life. And so these are questions that are really important questions that relate to the area of genetic um, technologies um, and really ones that you need to think through a little bit for yourself. Dolly was the first uh, cloned organism, a sheep. Um, subsequently, we've cloned cats and dogs. Um, and there may well be processes now that are, are looking at cloning humans. Um, the question again with cloning is where do we go to from there? Um, we haven't done a lot of uh, study on evolution, which we will later on, but one of the, the premises of evolution is variation, that evolution acts on variation within populations. And the problem with cloning is that every individual will end up identical, genetically identical. Now there may be aspects of the environment that make some changes, but um, exposure to certain types of diseases um, can have devastating effects on a um, group of organisms who have been cloned, who are all identical genetically. Um, so it reduces variation and therefore reduces um, the richness that we see in natural populations upon which evolution operates. Even such things as genetically modified organisms or foods that have been produced um, through the process of genetic modification um, should all of these be labelled? Um, even if they were, would you choose not to um, consume products that were genetically modified? All of these are very significant implications um, and are part of our study of genetics um, because they help fill in some of those gaps and they also answer more, uh, um, raise more questions for us to have to uh, think about and answer. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, lots of things that are implications of genetic um, and biotechnology, um, but also a significant change that's occurred in uh, human health and um, in feeding the populations of the world. So it's a bit of a balancing act. Thanks for watching.